I love a good Manhattan. Welcome back to The Meaning of Catholic. This is Paleocrat Diaries, and I'll be your host, Jake Fowler. Part 6, Ecumenical Councils. We've made it, finally. I say that every time. It's almost like I'm going too slowly. I'm no Jeremiah Bannister. I can't talk that fast. We've been through Nicaea. We looked at Constantinople I. We looked at Ephesus. And today will be the aftermath of Ephesus leading up to Chalcedon. We've only got 20 years to cover. So today may be a little shorter. We'll see if I can stretch it out a little bit, make it interesting. Hopefully you've been enjoying this. I know I have. All right. Without further ado. Music turned down. There we go. I like this interface. It's very easy to use. Okay. Outline. Check. Okay. But like I was saying, we left off. We had, we had just experienced, if you will, the Council of Ephesus. We looked at Nestorianism for all its glory, all of its shortcomings, and the church's response to it. Uh, and I think we concluded, r- remarking that there are still Nestorians today. They left the church. And the tale we're about to embark upon, or rather continue upon, is one that ends the same way. So let's turn then to the Monophysite controversy. It begins shortly after our previous episode, part five, concludes. So we're looking at about the year 448. There's a man named Eutyches, or Eutyches. He's a monk. He lives in Constantinople. He's an Archimandrite, which is sort of like, uh, you could think of him like an abbot or whatever would be just below a bishop, if there were such a canonical rank. He's a very aged man. He's well-respected. He has uh, a great reputation up to this point. He's well-connected. But if we're being honest, he's not a very clear thinker. His saving grace, uh, I mentioned, he was very well-connected. And his godson, as a matter of fact, was the Grand Chamberlain, to the emperor. This man's name was Chrysaphius. Chrysaphius uh, was sort of in charge of the imperial household, and he would have had very intimate meetings and opportunities to sway Theodosius II uh, and kind of, well, just exert normal political influence, you know, uh, friends and, and promotions and that sort of thing. And so Eutyches, the monk, it would have been kept in a very close and comfy position because of his connections. Eutyches, uh, he wasn't awesome at theology. Let's let's just be let's be blunt. He believed firmly. He was a Cyrillian, meaning he followed the teachings of Saint Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria, but he took it perhaps a step further. Indeed, a step further, and indeed a step too far. He used Cyril's phrase, one incarnate nature of the divine word. Remember, Cyril got this from what he believed to be Athanasius's writings. It turned out to actually be a heretic, Apollinaris of Laodicea. But Eutyches picks up this banner, one incarnate nature of the divine word, and he interprets it in as strict a manner as possible. He leaves no room for a true human nature in the person of Christ. St. Cyril, on the other hand, uh, in his reconciliation, recall, with John of Antioch, he did leave room for that sort of interpretation, right? And we now know with, you know, uh, uh, 1,500 plus years of hindsight that that was very wise of Cyril. But Eutyches didn't follow that path. He believed that the Son of God, Christ, was consubstantial with the Father and that the Blessed Virgin was consubstantial with us, but he wouldn't say that Jesus was consubstantial with us. He wouldn't go that far because to say that 
would mean that he had a real human nature, a true human nature, and that just wasn't what St. Cyril taught, or so he believed. For Eutyches, there were two natures before the incarnation, and then one afterward. They sort of formed a composition, if you will. This is why it's called monophysitism or monophysitism, one naturism, right? Mono, the Greek root for one, uh, phusis, nature. So one nature, hence the monophysites, monophysitism, uh, etc. So again, Eutyches believes there's two natures prior to the incarnation and one afterwards. This is precisely the opposite of what's actually true. Prior to the incarnation, prior to God the Word taking on human flesh, there's only the divine nature in the person of the Son. It's not until he is incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin that there's a second nature hypostatically united to his person. So Eutyches has it exactly flipped. But he makes his stand on this. It didn't go unnoticed. There were some people, uh, bishops notably, who wrote and spoke and taught against Eutyches. First among which I'll mention a man named Theodoret of Cyrus, or Cyrus, I'm not sure how to say it. He wrote against Eutyches, but he didn't mention him by name. It was pretty obvious though, and it angered his party. It angered Chrysaphius. And what angered the Grand Chamberlain angered the Emperor. Theodoret strongly affirmed two natures in Christ, almost to the point where he could be said to be borderline Nestorian. Now, Theodoret was an Antiochene theologian. He was a suffragan bishop under the See of Antioch, whose occupant, Domnus, supported Theodoret wholeheartedly. Theodoret was a better theologian than the patriarch was. And truth be told, at the previous council, Theodoret initially sided with Nestorius. It wasn't until some years later, uh, I believe in the 440s, that Theodoret was finally convinced to, to drop his support for Nestorius to sign the formula of union that was being presented to him by John of Antioch, by uh, Cyril himself. So Theodoret causing uh, these buzzings, these stirrings against Eutyches would have drummed up suspicion that Nestorianism was underfoot. I mentioned Domnus of Antioch a moment ago. He also wrote and spoke against Eutyches, as did a man named Eusebius, who was the bishop of Dorylaeum. This man even brought charges against Eutyches at the Home Synod, which I'll explain in a moment. Eusebius, he was the one who stood up and shouted down Nestorius when he was preaching in his own cathedral against Theotokos. Eusebius was a layman at the time, a lawyer, very well-educated man, and he decries the patriarch in the middle of the divine liturgy. This is the only, the only example from the early church that I'm aware of. If there are others, somebody tell me. I'm not aware of any. This is the only example where a layman presumes to correct a bishop. Now, that's sort of a temptation these days, isn't it? I'm tempted to do that. You might be tempted to do that. I would say let's not. We need to realize what is our place. Where did God put us in life? What is our state? I'm not ordained. Eusebius wasn't ordained back then either. And although he turned out to be correct, as many of us might be today, I would still argue that he is the exception that proves the rule. We ought not publicly decry bishop after bishop, pope after pope, at least not without sincerely weighing the consequences. Some hefty prayer 
and discernment needs to go into that decision. But I digress. Eusebius of Dorylaeum brought charges against Eutyches at the Home Synod. The Home Synod uh, was headed up by the Patriarch of Constantinople, and it was a regular gathering of bishops in and around the capital, those who uh, were suffragans to the Metropolitan, to the Patriarch. And you could think of it sort of like what we have today with the Synod of Bishops that meets every three years. This would have been somewhat more regularly. I think every six months, if I remember correctly, the Home Synod would gather sort of like a checkup. How's everyone doing? What issues are you facing? What do we need to address? And so in 448, Eusebius brings charges against Eutyches before the patriarch, whose name was Flavian. The case was reviewed, and Flavian, along with Florentius, the imperial commissioner, imperial officials were almost always involved, especially in the affairs of the church at Constantinople. So Flavian, Florentius, the imperial official, and the other attendees of the home synod decided against Eutyches. He was condemned, deposed, and excommunicated. He refused to recant his errors. Right? Remember, he wants to say one nature in the person of Christ. It's been suggested, and I think there may be something to this, that Florentius, the imperial commissioner, was working for the Patriarch of Alexandria, a man whose name is Dioscorus. And Dioscorus and Florentius perhaps conspired to get Eutyches condemned. Why? So that they had a reason to move against Flavian. Eutyches would have been on their side. Now, I don't know if he would have been in on this plot. In fact, again, I, I don't know that this is 100% the case. But it seems plausible, and I'm inclined to think probable, that Dioscorus and Florentius were scheming. Scheming. They needed to draw Flavian out, right? And anyone else who agreed with him that there were two natures in Christ. And so they used Eutyches, with or without his knowledge, in order to have a reason to go against Flavian. Will we ever really know? Obviously not. Speculation on, on both sides. But again, I think it's possible and indeed probable. So Eutyches condemned, deposed, and excommunicated. Dioscorus of Alexandria responds. In collaboration with Eutyches and Chrysaphius, and this is why I think it's probable, because he immediately collaborates with Eutyches and the Grand Chamberlain. In collaboration with these two, Flavian is attacked. He attempts to resign. He just wants nothing to do with it. He's like, look, fine, whatever, I'm out of here, I'll just retire. He was probably an old man at the time. But the emperor, Theodosius II, rejected it. He didn't allow him to resign. Instead, Flavian was forced to submit uh, to what Father Davis uh, in his book calls a strongly Cyrillian creed. And what I take Father Leo Davis to mean is that strongly Cyrillian is sort of like borderline heretical because strongly Cyrillian in this case meant that only one nature was acknowledged. They didn't say that there weren't two natures, but they didn't say that there were. They only mentioned, Flavian had to sign this thing that said, only about the divine nature. So it leads one to believe one incarnate nature of the divine word, this banner under which Eutyches is making his stand. Pope Leo intervenes. He writes a letter to Flavian to settle this dispute, but the emperor wants a council. Leo agrees. Theodosius II summons all the bishops of the world to Ephesus in the following year, 449. 
Theodosius also gives the presidency to Dioscorus. And he's supported by Juvenal, the patriarch of Jerusalem, and a man named Thalassius of Cappadocian Caesarea. This would have been where St. Basil was the bishop at one time in the previous century. So here we have what has come down to us as the robber council of Ephesus. Again, 449 AD, under the presidency of Dioscorus. Theodosius summoned it. Leo agreed. Let's be honest. Leo agreed. He sent legates. But Dioscorus didn't let them speak. The council opens. The papal legates are there. There's a man named uh, Julian. He's a bishop of Puzzioli. I think that's how you say it. Somewhere in Italy. He didn't speak Greek. He only knew Latin. There was a priest who accompanied him, Hilary, and a notary, Dulcetius. They were isolated from him. Those would have been the ones who could have translated from the Greek. There was a fourth man who went from Italy to the council in Ephesus, Renatus. But he died. He died on the way. I mean, we, we, we've mentioned before about the difficulty of travel, going from place to place was long and arduous and indeed dangerous. And case in point, you send four guys, only three of them show up. Renatus, the one who passed away, he was the most capable of them all. And he's not available. So Julian, the bishop who would have been seated near the front of this conciliar assembly, near Dioscorus, near Juvenal of Jer Jerusalem, but he didn't know Greek. Hilary and the notary Dulcetius were kept away from him, I think on purpose, to prevent the papal legate from comprehending what's going on. So Flavian can be thoroughly attacked and denounced. Not only Flavian, but Eusebius of Dorylaeum, the man who brought charges against Eutyches, Theodoret of Cyrus, and another bishop, Ebas of Edessa. They were all condemned, all four of them. And the protests immediately begin. The protests because the legates were not allowed to speak. Recall, I mentioned in passing, Leo had written a letter to Flavian to settle this whole thing. This is what we now call Leo's tome. Dioscorus didn't allow it. He kept coming up with reasons why he shouldn't. Procedural reasons. Well, maybe we'll do it later. Well, so-and-so needs to speak first. Well, let's hear from Eutyches. And so the legates never did get their turn. And so the protests begin. Flavian, Eusebius, and Hilary, amongst who knows how many others, raise their voices in opposition. Flavian cries out in Greek, I disdain your authority. Hilary, in Latin, contradictitur, I speak against you in the name of the Holy Father. Dioscorus feigns being attacked. He blows the whistle, so to speak. And who rushes in? Who else? Soldiers the imperial guard, and fanatical monks with clubs and bad attitudes. And so, naturally, the beatings ensue. Hilary is trying to make his way toward Flavian, who's the main target, it seems, the main target of this attack. Flavian, it's said, from the sources that I was perusing, was trying to take shelter in the sanctuary of the church, clinging to the high altar. He suffered severe injuries. Eventually, Hilary, the priest, one of the papal legates, gets him to safety in the sacristy of the cathedral. And it's there, we're told, that Flavian writes a letter to Pope Leo. Now, I have to imagine after the raucous scene that would have just preceded, this letter would possibly have been wet from sweat, tears, stained with blood, crumpled up, 
the handwriting, shaky, jittery, maybe not even legible. And it would have been in Greek. Hillary would have had to translate this into Latin for Leo. Hillary, the priest, he escapes. He flees the city all by himself. Remember, Renatus died on the way there. Now, Hillary, alone, with no entourage, no supplies, no weapons that we know of, has to make his way from Ephesus to Rome. And he has to dodge imperial spies and troops and whatever they had for police back then. Flavian, for his part, he died. He died a few days later, suffering from his injuries. Hillary wouldn't have known that at first. He made his escape that very night. Eusebius of Dorylaeum also escaped the city, but by a different route. The two of them traveled to Rome unbeknownst to the other. When they arrived there, Hillary presents what happened to Pope Leo. You can imagine the shock of Leo at that time. And then Eusebius of Dorylaeum arrives and fills in more details about what happened. Holy Father, you won't believe it. Dioscorus and Eutyches, what they said, what they did, and Flavian, he's dead. It's a disaster. Leo responds. He says, non eret concilium, eret latrocinium. This is not a council. This was a robbery. But what could he do? He had agreed that this council be called. Theodosius was the one who was enforcing it. Well, the next year, as luck would have it, the next year, Theodosius dies in 450 in a hunting accident. He was out. He was on his horse. He fell off, broke his back, and died a few days later from his injuries. And surprise, surprise, support for this new heresy, which at that time would have been known as Eutychianism, we now call it Monophysitism or Monophysitism, support for this heresy fizzles out. This usually happens, right? When a, an empire props up a false theology and then the power behind it disappears, suddenly, all the bishops are like, well, since I'm not being forced anymore, I guess I could speak my mind. And this was wrong all along. Hmm. With Theodosius out of the way, Pulcheria, his sister, who was Orthodox, takes over. She claims the regency for herself. So now she's the empress. And she almost immediately marries a very able general, a man named Marcion, also orthodox. They both supported Leo over and against Dioscorus. Now, at this point, I think I mentioned this, Leo had written his tome to Flavian. Theodosius is dead. The bishops are starting to come around. Leo thinks, well, this, this is going to solve itself. This problem is going away. My letter will stand. Everything's going to be all right. But the imperial family, Pulcheria and Marcion, they have other ideas. They want another council. Leo didn't want a council at first. He said, look, the dispute is solving itself. Eutyches is still condemned by the Holy See. These bishops are changing their mind about what happened at the robber council. Even though most of them condemned Flavian, Eusebius of Dorylaeum, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ebes of Edessa, they don't seem to be doing much about it. But Marcion and Pulcheria, they insist. So Leo says, okay, fine, we'll have a council. Let's have it in Italy. 
Let's have it here where I can keep a close eye on the proceedings. No. If we're going to have a council, they said, we're going to have it in the east. So they call it for Nicaea. But the Huns, who were still causing problems on the Roman frontier, they kept Marcion at home in Constantinople. He couldn't really leave to go and attend to ecclesiastical matters. So he orders the council to relocate. It was called for Nicaea, but he says move it to Chalcedon. Chalcedon is right across the Bosporus from Constantinople. So Marcion can stay with his advisors, his, his uh, military personnel, and just across the water, he has all the bishops right there, so he can do both. Pretty good compromise, and Leo agrees. This is now the second council that Leo has agreed to. This was in, uh, I, I failed to mention this a moment ago, in the year 451. So here we go again. Bishops start to gather in Asia Minor. They're coming to the capital city. They're hanging out. They're waiting for the Council of Chalcedon to begin. Some have already arrived, and they're just sort of waiting. Uh, this would have been early September. But it would be about five more weeks until enough of them were there to begin. Well, this five weeks allows time for intrigue and power plays. Dioscorus is not giving up. He excommunicates Leo on the grounds that Leo refused to recognize the last council, the robber council. Now, obviously, Dioscorus wouldn't have called it that. According to a church historian, uh, an 18th century church historian named Cardinal Orsai, Dioscorus made 10 bishops sign the excommunication of Pope Leo. Apparently, a lot of them were crying. They were lamenting the fact that what Dioscorus was doing was unjust. There was weeping. There was the gnashing of teeth. They sensed the evilness of their act. Dioscorus is forcing me to excommunicate the Pope? But they cooperated, at least materially. Now, some of Dioscorus's most loyal followers, they balked at this. A lot of the Egyptian bishops were not prepared to sever communion with Rome just like that. They recognized there's something particular about the apostolic see. This move cast Dioscorus in a somewhat negative light. He was shown for what he really was, a hothead, just like Cyril. I should add, Flavian, the patriarch of Constantinople, the deceased patriarch, he was an Antiochian theologian. Dioscorus was Alexandrian. So here we go again. First, we had St. John Chrysostom and Theophilus, Cyril's uncle. Then we had Cyril versus Nestorius. Now we have Dioscorus versus Flavian. The first two times, Alexandria prevailed. This last time, the third time, although Flavian lost his life, Alexandria is in the wrong. Excommunicating the Pope was a bridge too far. His own bishops didn't like it. It put a sour taste in everyone's mouth. And as we near the 30 minute mark, we're going to pause. We'll pick it up next time. A few days, a week, we'll see. Uh, Time management is a skill that I've worked on. Nonetheless, we'll press on. Next time, we'll look at the Council of Chalcedon, what the Council said and did, how it went. Probably cover a little bit of the aftermath. In the meantime, continue to patronize the meaning of Catholic, 
Continue to watch Paleocrat Diaries. Don't forget, Jeremiah's on Reason and Theology on Mondays as well. You can catch Kennedy Hall on the Crusade Channel. And, before I forget, look at this. Brand new, just came in today. Tim Flanders' book, City of God vs. City of Man. And, oh, wait for it. Boom. Can you see that? Terror of Demons, Kennedy's book. Now, this is the collector's edition. It's in reprint uh, from Tan, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Wherever it's being reprinted, go buy it. You can find it on Amazon. Patronize this channel. Support us. Keep watching. You might learn something. I guess I should go. I've kept you all here long enough. Thanks for your attention. And as always, we'll close out, as we always do. Never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori. God bless you, and good night.